Hello, you are watching Eye on Africa. I'm James Creedon. Here are our headlines this Monday evening. The authorities in South Africa are seeking clues after 21 teenagers died in a packed bar. We'll hear more from our correspondent in Cape Town. The US is to mobilise $200 million billion of investment in global infrastructure projects in the next five years. This in a bid to counter China's Belt and Roads initiative. And most of that investment will be in Africa. And a little later on in studio, we'll hear from Mo Lodi. He's a South African multidisciplinary artist, DJ and curator. Uh, he'll be telling us about his Globalisto philosophy and exhibition taking place in Saint Etienne later on this summer. Thanks for watching. Now, uh, the cause of a tragedy in which 21 uh, young people died in a tavern in South Africa's Eastern Cape on Sunday morning is still shrouded in mystery. On uh, Monday, police investigators continued to search for answers at any Obeni Tavern in East London. That's South Africa's sixth largest city. The bar was declared a crime scene on Sunday morning when the police were alerted to the tragedy at around 4 a.m. All of the victims were under the age of 18. Nadine Tehran has more from Cape Town. Parents still have no idea what's killed 21 children who are out celebrating the end of mid-year exams at a tavern in the Eastern Cape on Sunday. Nine girls and 12 boys died in the crowds of the packed tavern. The youngest was 13 years old. In South Africa, taverns are pubs or bars, often with dance floors where food is also served. The Eastern Cape Liquor Board has shut in Yobeni Tavern down for contravening the Liquor Act, which stipulates that alcohol cannot be sold to anyone under the age of 18. But community members say that the board has extended licenses to those kind of pubs before. Disturbing images have been circulating on social media, showing bodies strewn across tables and chairs and the floor. Eyewitnesses who were at the tavern on Sunday say they saw a substance being sprayed at patrons to get them to go home. Police Minister Berkit Prele visited the site on Sunday and has deployed a top team of forensic investigators from Pretoria to determine the cause of the deaths. Police are hoping the results of the toxicology reports will provide some answers. President Cyril Ramaphosa on Sunday sent his condolences to the families of the deceased, saying that the tragedy is even more grave because it occurred during youth month in the country. The G7 has officially launched an initiative called the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment. This scheme aims to deliver an investment on infrastructure projects, primarily in Africa. Some $600 billion will be invested over the next five years, a third of that money coming from the United States, the rest from other G7 countries and private donors. Um, the Senegalese president, Macky Sall, who is currently also head of the African Union, has been invited to those G7 talks, which are running until Tuesday. Sam Bradpiece is following that story for us from Dakar. Let's take a listen to him. This huge investment target is about countering the influence of China on the global stage. Over the past decade, China has been by far and away the largest single source of foreign direct investment on the African continent and is enjoying increasingly close relationships with many African governments. The G7 have presented the investment plan as an opportunity to orient African countries away from China's state-led economic imperialism and towards free market values and democracy. G7 countries are worried, essentially, that in the context of rising global inflation, African countries may turn their backs on global markets, move increasingly towards China, and engage in other bilateral trade deals that would disadvantage G7 economies. You have to remember that all of the G7 economies in enjoy large trade surpluses with Africa and rely on the continent to import a vast quantity of resources in terms of energy, minerals and metals. So critics would say that this investment plan is merely self-interest. G7 leaders, on the other hand, could argue that they do genuinely have development you know, in their minds when it comes to this investment. And they would point to decisions to fund, for example, a massive solar project in Angola or a vaccine manufacturing plant here in Senegal as examples of that. 
About 30 villagers were killed in weekend attacks in the Akwaya district of Cameroon's southwest region. Now, local sources say the deaths were due to a feud over land between neighbouring communities, that feud aggravated by separatist insurgents acting as mercenaries. Now, Anglophone insurgents began fighting the Cameroonian military in uh, the southwest and northwest regions in 2017 after protests calling for greater representation for the country's English-speaking minority uh, were violently repressed. The African Union has called for an immediate investigation into the deaths of at least 23 migrants who died on Friday, this after a huge crowd tried to cross into Spain's North African enclave of Melilla. Now, the AU uh, Commission spokesman, uh, Moussa Faki Mohamed, uh, was, said he was shocked and concerned about the treatment that African migrants receive when they attempt to cross international borders. Vedika Bahel has more. It's the heaviest toll in years in attempts to cross the Moroccan-Spanish border. After unprecedented violence that killed tens of sub-Saharan migrants and wounded over 100 Moroccan border guards, the African Union has called for a probe. I call for an immediate investigation into the matter and remind all countries of their obligations under international law to treat all migrants with dignity and to prioritise their safety and human rights while refraining from the use of excessive force. Around 2,000 migrants stormed the heavily armed frontier on Friday between the Moroccan Nador region and the Spanish enclave of Melilla. Whilst authorities called it a stampede, footage shared by human rights groups showed hundreds of migrants bleeding on the ground, surrounded and beaten by police. Protests were held across Spain on Sunday in solidarity with the victims, also criticising President Pedro Sánchez for failing to condemn the violent police response, instead placing blame on international mafias. We demand that the Spanish government investigate and take responsibility for the actions at the southern border. Melilla is one of the EU's only land borders with Africa, making it a frequent target for people fleeing war and poverty trying to reach Europe. Now, earlier in studio, I uh, spoke to artist, composer and producer Mo Laudi. He's uh, South African and lives between Johannesburg and Paris. He is a curator of an exhibition in Saint-Étienne, running until October. The title of that exhibition is Globalisto, and artists from across Africa are participating. He started by telling me what the philosophy of the exhibition is. Let's take a listen. Ever since I was young, I had this idea of a, a new philosophy. It's inspired a lot by negritude, uh, tigritude, pan-Africanism, war to the principle of gratitude and radical hospitality and coming together. So it's questioning the idea of borders that exist within, in the, within the continent of Africa and questioning uh, what is this relationship that we have between human beings and how we can, can create a network of artists throughout the diaspora. So it's questioning, I suppose, the idea of, of, of statehood, even the nation state. Absolutely. Which is, I suppose, a European transposition on yes. Africa, right? Yes. You've got all these pe yes. peculiar, bizarre borders Absolutely. in Africa that don't make any sense. Hard borders that right. exist now that were created by European powers during colonialism, and now we still live within those borders. So how can we exist without those borders? And how do we relate? What would you, I mean, it's interesting that this exhibition is taking place in France at a mm. time when there is an increasing tension between the ideas of maybe border free and Europe without borders in the mm. Schengen zone or whatever. Mm. But more and more people are questioning mm. that politically. There's mm. this notion that we should come back mm. to the, the nation state, mm. to borders, a fear perhaps yeah. that Europe is going to become a much more international place uh, without borders and that uh, these movements of populations are something that I suppose some people are afraid of, right? But it's, perhaps it, it's a power is this game. inevitable, do you think? For Absolutely. Yeah. Eventually, I mean, you see that in Europe, and it's, it's a power game where the richer countries are suppressing the poorer country and extracting the resources. And then, so how can we have an equal playing field? How do we challenge this? And now, when you travel throughout Europe, if you're from an African country, you need visas, and, right, right, right. And, and sometimes these visas can take months. And so how 
how come? And then, but if you're European, you don't have the same issues sometimes. Well, I, uh, I often use the example of mm, Algeria, which was former, mm, formerly a part of France, mm, and there are these visa, visa considerations for mm, Algerians. I'm, I'm Irish with no history mm, uh, of <laughs> attachment to France. We love the Irish. But, <laughs> but I, I get the privilege mm, of, with the European passport of not having to worry about any visas in mm, France. So certainly mm, there's a two-tier Mm. system, isn't there? Mm, absolutely. So tell us about the exhibition, Globalisto, and what we can expect, what, what uh, people can expect to see at the festival, you, at the uh, exhibition. Yes, you have 19 artists in another work, and there's work uh, within the collection. There's photography, there's video, there's installation, and it's on from... Um, June all the way till through to October October sixteen. So you were telling us about the, the, so it, it, globally. So this is the overarching theme of the exhibition. Mm -hmm. right? So it's it's promote it's it's radical hospitality, mm. openness to unlearn. Mm. How how would you how would you go further into explaining that the, an openness to unlearn? It's a challenging question because we are we are taught a certain kind of history, a Western kind of history, without taking into consideration the other history, the African history, that point of view. Even when I was born, I knew I was taught uh, European history. Mm -hmm. So how do you imagine a, a history where Europe is not the center of the world? Now, there was one thing that I, when I was preparing for this that I read that I thought that was quite interesting, cancel culture, right? So we, mm. we can loosely put this under the under the often critical mm. label of woke or uh, mm. wokeism. So where, where the idea that physical statues or mm. historical figures who were involved in slavery, involved mm. in all sorts of reprehensible activities, that these statues should be taken down. Broadly speaking, it's known as cancel culture. But you have another term, not cancel culture, but can you remember? <laughs> uh, I would say, uh, why not instead of council culture, council culture, how can we counsel each other and create a council culture? So in a way, starting a dialogue, the process of taking down the statues, instead of just taking them down immediately, we remove them, of course, because mm. you can't have racist, offensive statues in, in public spaces. But we start the process of having conversations and say why these statues are actually terrible. What does it mean? And then shift them nicely and then have this dialogue. And so then council educate culture, mm. to, to listen to one another, is that, is that Absolutely. the idea? Absolutely. Perhaps that's the generosity. Horizontal relations, Absolutely. Not relations, yes, right. that's the generosity, the hospitality, and the radical hospitality. Wonderful. Mm. Mo Lodi, speaking to me a little bit earlier in that Global East Toe exhibition uh, going until October in Saint Etienne. Thanks for watching tonight's Iron Africa. Do stay tuned. Special event. Depuis dix mois, le procès des attentats du 13 novembre 2015 se tient devant la cour d'assises spécialement constituée à Paris. Ce sont 300 victimes, dont des rescapés de cette nuit d'horreur, qui ont témoigné à la barre. 20 défendants sont being judged par this special criminal court. Amongst them is Salah Abdeslam, the sole survivor of the Islamic State group cell that carried out these attacks. Talab al Muhammoun al Ammoun bi izdar ahkam mushaddada bi haqi kulli al muttahamin. ولا سيما السجن المؤبد الذي لا يقبل التخفيف بحق صلاح عبد السلام El veredicto está previsto para el 29 de junio. Las cuatro cadenas de France 24 realizaremos programas especiales para hacerles vivir en primera persona el desenlace de este proceso fuera de lo común. The Paris terror attacks of November 13th, 2015. Watch the verdict live on France 24 and france24.com. Versailles Mont Saint-Michel, the Louvre, are well-known stars of French heritage. But French genius and France harbors many other hidden treasures. The arts, gastronomy, architecture, as well as nature's wonders. Come along with France 24. Discover France's living heritage. From young apprentices to accomplished craftsmen and farmers, to Michelin star sporting chefs, meet these people whose passion for their professions preserve and drive French heritage. You are here on France 24 and France24.com.